Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, can I invite you to please try and fill the seats at the front? I know that's going to be a hard task, but I'm inviting you to fill the seats to the front of the auditorium. Of course, the speakers will interact better with the audience if you're closer. All right, that was a challenge. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to welcome each and every one of you here this evening as we celebrate, firstly, International Credit Union Day tomorrow and right here in Montserrat Credit Union Week under the team Finding Your Platinum Lining in Credit Unions. With that said, permit me to establish a protocol and welcome all official dignitaries or guests. I recognize the presence of the Honorable Premier, Minister of Finance, Economic Development, Honorable Donaldson Romeo, the presence of our Leader of Opposition, the Honorable Easton Taylor Farrell, Recognize the presence of the Honorable Samuel Joseph, Opposition MP. We recognize the President of the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union, Mr. Eugene Skerritt, the President of the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions, Mr. Winston Fletcher, and of course his Deputy and General Manager, Mr. Peter, and he will correct me with the last name, uh, Etienne, that is correct. We also recognize our main speaker this evening who will be delivering the feature address from the United States, Salt Bay, California, Mr. Chris Otte. I had the last name right as well? Excellent. And of course, to the board members, the committee members of the credit union, shareholders, members, all staff, and everyone here joining us as well via liveislandevents.com and via the World Wide Web and on ZJB Radio. I welcome you all to the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union annual, well, it's not annual, it's an annual lecture, but first time here in Montserrat, uh, Sir, Ever Dean Memorial Lecture, and we're honored to have it held here in Montserrat this year. And so I welcome you here this evening to this lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, the Credit Union is recognizing 61 years of incorporation here in Montserrat and celebrating some 70 years of International Credit Union Day tomorrow or this week, and that is a significant milestone. The Credit Union has contributed significantly to nation building here in Montserrat, coming from humble grassroots beginnings and has established itself as a major player in Montserrat's development and in the financial society here in Ireland. Tonight, we will be graced with the presence of several speeches and of course, our main lecture. We will be hearing from our honorable premier we also will be hearing from the president of the CCCU. And of course, our main feature this evening, Mr. Chris Otte. And his topic here this evening will be based on technology and how it helps in the digital customer experience. And of course, advancing in the 20th century, 21st century, it's important that we, we move with the times. And so I look forward as well, Mr. Orte, to your presentation here this evening. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Easton Taylor Farrell, to the podium to grace us with his presence and invoke God's presence here on us. Can we all stand, please? Dear Lord and Father of mankind, 
forgive our foolish ways. Lord, we thank you for your promises that reminds us that where we meet, you are with us. And so we thank you for your presence with us this evening as we gather to celebrate as credit union, as a credit union family. We give you thanks, Lord, for the work of the credit union here at home, across the region, and indeed across the world. We thank you for its service to humanity, its service in improving the lives of all peoples. We ask your continued blessings on it and its continued success that it strive to go forward in the future that the lives of humanity will be improved more and more. As we gather this evening, Lord, to celebrate another week, another week of celebration, we thank you for the past mercies, and we thank you for mercies that are yet to come. We now invite your presence with us tonight as we embark upon this lecture. And Lord, we thank you for those who have walked the road before us, have laid the path so that this organization can continue to strive. We pray for the lecture this evening, O oh God, that you'll give us wisdom and understanding, cleanse our thoughts and our minds, that you be more enlightened, Lord, to face the future, recognizing that this world is a changing world and we must change with times. We pray for the person who delivered the main speaker, Lord, the the main lecturer. We ask for your guidance and your direction. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you bless us all as we move forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated all. And thank you very much, Honorable Taylor, uh, for invoking his God, in God's presence here on us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the credit union has boasted of some significant achievements over the past years. Just recently we've heard the, the managing director speaking to the advances that has been recognized by the credit union. And I'm certain as the night goes on, we will be hearing some more. Um, I would like to, at this time, invite the chairman, president of the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union, distinguished Mr. Eugene Skerritt, to the podium to give his welcome remarks to us here this evening. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and please permit me to adopt the protocol already established by our chairperson in Mr. Jermaine Wade, and to, of course, on behalf of the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union, extend to you the warmest and heartfelt welcome to this, the lecture, the Sir Everard Dean Lecture, which I, I know will be an exciting and information-driven lecture. I take this opportunity as well to also welcome the Honorable Premier here uh, to at least let us feel his presence along with the Leader of the Opposition and other members of the Assembly because we know that for things to happen, we all have to do it together. And so, I also extend to Mr. Fletcher, Mr. Etienne, and Mr. Otti, my heartfelt welcome to Montserrat, and, and express some, some sincerest thank yous as well for agreeing for Montserrat to be the host of this important lecture. Let me, at this time, single out our general manager, Mr. Peter Queeley, and the staff of the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union for the effort they extended in securing the lecture for Montserrat. As we celebrate 61 years of service to the Montserrat community, we also must extend our gratitude to the stalwarts like the late Honorable Bertrand Osborne, Mr. George KB, Mr. Magella Castle, and some who are still with us, Mr. Bennett Roach, Mr. Roosevelt Jemmott, 
Miss Rosalind Castle Seeley, along with Claudette Dublin and the several committees and boards that have served the SPCCU. That tiny cooperative, cooperative which started with the help of the late Bishop de Metz, a Catholic bishop, and two Catholic nuns in 1957 has grown to an organization that now boasts of approximately $60 million in assets and has become a financial institution of note. As we forge ahead, we realize with the help of several of our partners that we have to keep pace with the Global Trust to move to a seamless, cashless landscape for our members to do their transactions. We also realize that constant training and retooling is essential for cooperatives to grow and increase their impact on the financial world. It is with this in mind and the realization that upgrading is in the theme for what this evening is all about that the presentation was chosen. In our modern credit unions, we expect members to be able to access their accounts from any country at any time utilizing the technologies that are available. We expect to see increased market share in the financial markets by our credit unions and members witnessing improved livelihoods and standards of living. By extension, we expect that improvement in the overall development of our countries and region will be realized through these efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, let me once again say welcome on behalf of the entire credit union community here on Montserrat. And to say to the members, we are thankful that you've been able to come and to share this event with us. And to all our visitors once again, heartfelt welcome to the Emerald Isle. And we hope that you will truly appreciate the beauty, the crime-free environment, the wonderful greenery all around you, and the fact that we are, in some respects, the way the Caribbean used to be. And we're going to try to hold on to that bit, but by the same token, we are moving to where we think the Caribbean should be. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you to you, Mr. Eugene Skerritt. Um, almost thinking that he needs to be in the tourism division, as he sells months right there, the way the Caribbean used to be. I like that. Um, of course, you highlighted the, the intent and the, uh, the, the desire for the credit union to advance technologically as persons would like to access their accounts from anywhere in the world. And I think that is something that we all, as members, would love to see um, come into pass or come into fruition in the short order. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite to the podium and to our microphone, Premier and Minister of Finance, Economic Development, the Honorable Donaldson Romeo, who will give us some remarks this evening. Honorable Premier Donaldson Romeo. is already established, but I want to also extend my greetings and welcome. Um, first, I must acknowledge the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Dr. Sammy Joseph, and I want to refer to the gentleman on my left at the table as the Credit Union Chiefs. I don't know exactly the names. I don't remember. I was introduced to them a while ago, but I refer to them as Credit Union Chiefs. And the lady in front of me, who happened to be on Liat, and I didn't know who she was, right next to me. You have to be careful. Treat people well. And um, of course, to everyone listening before me, 
as well as those listening from afar via internet and on the radio. It is my utmost pleasure this evening to give brief remarks on this occasion, which has been organized by the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union. No one can deny the substantial role the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union has played in Montserrat's economy and in its social fabric. The hard work performed by its members is a testament that nothing is, imp is impossible when we work together to advance the common economic interest for all of our people. We are certainly living in interesting times. The rising geopolitical tensions, economic and trade challenges, and global fiscal landscape, all of it are making governance challenging. Moreover, the role of technology, especially in the area of finance, is creating new opportunities, but with that comes the challenges. Nowhere else has technology penetrated quite rapidly and extensively than in the realm of finance. As financial institutions become more digitally enhanced, the expectations from the customers are also changing. Technology has paved the way for ordinary account holders and customers to not only stay connected to their financial picture, but also have real-time information that can help them to make investment decisions for the long term. Moreover, technology must serve the interests of its users and not the other way around. With faster digital speed and availability of many applications, customers are becoming more aware of what they need and what they demand of their institutions. It is in this context that both the private and public sector must work together to harness the power of technology to serve our citizens. That is why my government signed an MOU with BIT, a digital payment company from Barbados that specializes in the digital technology when it comes to buying and selling of services and products. Government of Montserrat has also embraced the usage of credit cards and more recently debit cards for receiving payments from the public. You can now pay your government services with your debit or credit cards at the Treasury Department, Customs and Exercise, Excise, sorry, MCWL, Police, and Hospital. Would you believe it? Further, government is leading the way with online processing through ASICUDA for Customs Clearance, where brokers and merchants can clear their goods online. Really good. Lastly, government also interfaces with the public and collects fees online via an online visa system, the land information system, the ferry booking system, and soon with a vehicle and driver's license system. Technology and the change it brings to custom attitude is a continuous process. It is up to us, both the public and private sector, to make sure that technology serves the broader social and economic purpose for, of facilitation and ease. I'm not asked to say much more. I was given five minutes, and I think I've done good so far. I told you I'm tempted to say a bit more, but I'll save it for later. And with that, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And um, I just want to say, as usual, may God bless you all, and may God bless Montserrat. Thank you. And thank you to the Honorable Premier for your brief remarks, highlighting government's advances Technology, with technology 
And of course, I'm certain our citizens are delighted that they can utilize the services of technology at main departments, customs, the hospital, and he listed a long list of areas that we can now pay digitally as we move away from a cashless system. And so, Premier Romeo, I want to thank you very much for your input here this evening. And I'm certain it was well received by our listeners. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic I remind you is technology and how it helps in the digital customer experience. And of course, all of our speakers will be speaking along those lines here this evening. And as we move on, as we try to get to the main presentation here this evening, our lecture, I would like to invite the President of the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions, Mr. Winston Fletcher, to deliver his remarks at this um, memorial lecture series here this evening. Mr. Fletcher, please give Mr. Fletcher a warm welcome. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Master of Ceremonies. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant evening to you all. I will observe the protocols already established, but please allow me to acknowledge Honorable Minister, uh, Prime Minister, and Premier, and of course, my colleague, President. Congratulations are in order to you, sir for the good work you're doing here and keeping the movement alive. Of course, our keynote speaker, you will be more appropriately introduced, but my fellow corporators, a pleasant evening once more. And I too would like to extend warm welcome to you. The Board of the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions, in association with St. Patrick's Credit Union, or host of this year's lecture, is really indeed pleased to welcome you to this ninth lecture of the Sir Everard, Everard Dean Memorial Lecture. This lecture was designed to honor his memory and his distinguished record of service to the Caribbean Credit Union movement. And let me just give you a brief the genesis, where this comes from, goes back to the 27th annual general meeting of the Triple CU that was held in Trinidad back in 1998. It was this AGM that authorized the establishment of the Everett Dean Memorial Lecture and Scholarship Fund, a stalwart who has served the movement for over 40 years. The inaugural lecture was, first, was held in March of 2000 in Trinidad, and it was designed at the outset to be an annual event. However, for some reason, it had not followed that pattern. We have recently revamped the program, and it will now become an annual premier event of the Caribbean Credit Union calendar. Let me tell you a little bit about Sir Everard, son of the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago to be precise. He served as president of the Trinidad Cement Employees Credit Union, president of the Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago, served as vice chairman of the CUNA Caribbean Insurance, he was at different times a director, treasurer, and president of the Triple CU, and also first vice president of WACU as the World Council. A man, it would seem, with volunteerism in his DNA, his spirit of volunteerism was not confined, however, to the cooperative movement. He also served this country as as an independent senator from 1991 to 95, and in 1989, a grateful nation, Trinidad and Tobago, that is, 
bestowed on him the Hummingbird Medal for his distinguished service to the movement. Similarly, in 1996, recognizing his invaluable contribution to the cooperative movement, Waku also bestowed on him the Distinguished Service Award. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a minute to share some good news with you. You would be pleased to know that globally the movement continues to make great strides. Information just released by WACO shows some significant growth in some vital statistics. At December 2017, membership has grown to 260 million, surpassing the 250 million that was set as a 2020 target. The number of credit unions globally now stands at 89,026 and operating in 117 countries across six continents. According to WACO, these statistics reflect the importance of credit unions in our society. In spite of these successes, however, there are some challenges that credit unions face. There are three things that came up tops. This whole business of advocacy, the disruptive nature of technologies, and membership growth, especially as it relates to the youth population. And so it's therefore within this context that this lecture becomes not only relevant, but an imperative to our future as a movement. The theme is most appropriate because we are living in a digital era where technology becomes a crucial enabler and facilitator of competitive advantage. And so my brothers and sisters, from what I've just shared with you, it's not difficult for us to agree that the late Sir Everard, Everard Dean's vision is being realized. He has left behind a legacy of distinguished service to the cooperative movement at the level of country, region, and internationally. He too would have been proud of his, this impressive record, record of achievement and similarly just as concerned of the challenges. And it is therefore against this background that the Triple CU pays tribute to this extraordinary volunteer. I once again welcome you to this evening's lecture, knowing that you will be inspired. Happy International Credit Union Day when it comes tomorrow. Thank you. We want to thank Mr. Fletcher for so ably setting the context of the reason why we are celebrating um, this lecture, this memorial lecture and giving us some background as well on Mr. Everdeen. Some very useful information um, for the purposes of this lecture here this evening. So thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Fletcher. And of course, it's an open invitation for the Triple CU, I'm certain, to consider Montserrat in the future for another lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're getting closer to the feature presentation. And uh, as such, it gives me great pleasure to invite to the podium the Deputy General Manager for the Triple CU, uh, Mr. Peter Etienne, uh, to Etienne, that is correct, um, to deliver or to introduce, rather, our feature presentator, pre presentation here um, this evening. Sir, I invite you to the podium. Thank you very much, Mr. Masters of Ceremony, and good night to all. Please allow me to adopt the protocol that was ably established by you, Mr. Masters of Ceremony, and the previous speakers before me. I'll still recognize the presence of the Honorable Premier, who has the responsibility of finance under which credit union falls. 
We now come to the feature presentation by our guest speaker, Mr. Christopher Ote. Mr. Ote is the Chief Revenue Officer at Credit Union 2.0 and the Chairman of the Board at South Bay Credit Union. In this role, Chris is looking to create partnerships between fintech providers and credit unions to allow them to compete and thrive in a constantly changing digital environment. Previously, Chris was the Chief Revenue Officer at Credit Union Wallet. Chris was, the, was with Credit Union Wallet since its inception and was responsible for all the revenue generated for the Credit Union Service Organization, QSO. In his role with the Credit Union Wallet, Chris worked to unite the Credit Union industry behind a Credit Union-led, Credit Union-driven mobile wallet solution. He worked with credit unions, merchants, other credit union service organizations, state leagues, and associations to create the credit union-specific mobile payments ecosystem. Chris spent 18 years working in all facets of the credit union division within, within the FISER, including XP systems, summit information systems, and Linget solutions. Chris has sold, trained, and installed core processing, EFT services, wire services, internet banking, bill pay, mobile solutions, and accounting systems. Mr. Ote earned a BA in communications from California State University, Northridge. He lives in Redondo Beach, California. Mr. Chris Ote is therefore well-placed and technically qualified with the necessary expertise to speak on the topic technology and how it helps in the digital customer experience. It's my distinct pleasure to call to the microphone, Mr. Christopher Ote. the technical guy has technical difficulties. Does everyone see how ironic that is? Let's get that up there in just one second here. Thank you all very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. The, the hospitality has been, been overwhelming. Um, when I come home from these things, I generally try to tell my wife the hotel was miserable, the location was miserable, the travel was miserable. As soon as she heard the word Caribbean, everything that I'm going to tell her goes out the window. Right? That's all she sees is that her husband went to the Caribbean. She doesn't see that on Sunday morning, I woke up and went to Seattle. And then from Seattle, I took a red eye to Miami. And then from Miami to Antigua, and then from Antigua here. She doesn't see any of that. All she sees is palm trees and beaches. <laughs> so there's no getting around that. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, for the introduction. That was the best introduction I've had in months. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I was in. Seattle, Washington, the birthplace of Microsoft, the birthplace of technology earlier this week. You have more technology in this room than they had in the room I was in. That's pretty impressive, right? All I, everywhere I've been on the island, Wi-Fi has been spotless. I've been connecting. I've been FaceTiming the kids. I watched a Los Angeles Dodgers baseball game from my hotel room. That's how good the Wi-Fi was. So the infrastructure, I believe, is in place here, and I think you're set up to uh, to move forward by adopting technology in, in not just the credit union space, but on the island as ge in general. So I thought I'd give you a little overview of where I've been. It, this is going to be hard for me to stand still. I'm a walker and a talker and moving with my hands. So i give you a little overview of the things I've done and the places I've been and the things I've seen. Um, I got my start as a bank teller. I was a teller in a bank. I was the worst teller in the bank, but I was a bank teller. And as, as that's where I learned the difference between banks and credit unions, right? The banks would always tell me, our money smells better. We're prettier. We're better. Credit unions cheat because they don't get taxed. All these things that they would tell me about credit unions. And then lo and behold, I got a job at a credit union processor. And that's when I was indoctrinated into the credit union 
ethos. And the part I really love about it is that at no point in time in my 23 year career, holy cow, 23 year career in credit unions, have I ever been worried about a credit union making a bad decision? Not, not, not a bad decision like they picked the wrong processor, but a bad decision that, in the members, that is not in the members' best interest. Credit unions will always do what's right, and that's what I've always loved about credit unions, and that's why I'm so passionate about helping credit unions bring their technology forward into the 21st century. So a, as Peter mentioned, I, I worked at a company called Pfizer. It is a Fortune 500 company in the States with about 60% market share and 21,000 employees. I was the pure definition of middle management there, right in the middle of those 21,000 employees. But what it did give me a chance to do was to visit about, about 30 to 35 different credit unions a year for 18 years. So I've seen credit unions do things a lot of different ways, and I understand that some things that work for one credit union may not work for another credit union, right? While credit unions are part of the overall movement, there's an individuality to credit unions and a community ethos in each and every credit union that's different. It, it's different for me between yesterday and today, between being here on Montserrat and being in Antigua and the credit unions I visited, they were both great, but both different. So that, that's a thing to embrace, not to run away from. And then of course, what I think uniquely qualifies me is my time at South Bay Credit Union. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. You may wonder why, how I got on the South Bay Credit Union board. And I got on it because while I was spending all that time working at that large corporation and I was installing accounting systems and ACH systems and internet banking and mobile banking, I would ask questions of my fellow employees about you know, what is a capital ratio, what is a debt ratio, what is an allowance for loan loss. Nobody could explain it to me. Think about that. These are people selling core systems and they couldn't explain it. So I decided the only way I was going to learn was to actually go out and do it. So I just simply walked into my local credit union, of which I had been a member, South Bay Credit Union. I found the president of the credit union, and I simply said, my name's Chris. I live in the area. I'm a member. I'd like to volunteer. And that was a good solid 10, 11 years ago now. And I became the chairman of the board about three years ago. So it's been quite a learning experience for me. But that, that concentration in credit unions is what led me to start Credit Union 2.0. Me and my partners from a previous venture wrote a book called Credit Union 2.0. You, you've all got devices on you. You can all Google it. It's out there. You can go on Amazon. You can buy it. If you don't know how, I saw an eight-year-old in here who can show you. <laughs> right. So we, we, wrote, we wrote a book about, about credit unions and how they can digitally transform themselves. And it's called Credit Union 2.0. More than welcome to please go out and, and pick yourself up a copy. The important thing is, why did we do this? And we did this because there's a constant threat to credit unions, right? And that threat's not germane to the United States. That threat is global to credit unions, right? PayPal doesn't care where your credit union is located. They're out to steal your members, right? And that's one of thousands of examples. So you have these FinTech companies that are stealing pieces of your business. In the United States, it's a company called Rocket Mortgage. And they put ads all over the television and during the largest sporting events saying 90-second mortgage loan. Well, we all know that's not true. They may approve you in 90 seconds, but it takes two days on the back end. But they're, su they're having success because their app is easy to use. It's ubiquitous, it works on every device, and it's easy to use. And those are some examples, and we'll get into others later, of fintech companies nipping at the heels of credit unions. There's also the regulatory threat, right? Every single credit union I talk to, regardless of where they're located, has regulatory issues, and that's because the people perpetrating the fraud are getting smarter and adjusting, so the regulations have to change. Complaining about regulations isn't going to get us anywhere. Regulations are there to protect us from ourselves and to protect our members and honor our fiduciary responsibility to the members. So regulation is going to be a constantly evolving thing. Uh, mergers aren't so much an issue here in the Caribbean, but in the United States, we've gone from 13,000 credit unions when I started to just under 6,000 credit unions. We were losing a credit union a day to merger for a long time. It's finally slowing down. There's also the digital risk, right? The risk of not being digital, the risk of still being an analog financial institution. That's big. And then, of course, the service issue. So what I thought I'd do is focus on when we started to write the book and started to put together this speech. We thought we'd focus on what credit unions did well and what credit unions struggle with, right? 
what we do well is we do what is right. Like I mentioned at the top, credit unions always make the decision that's in the best interest of the member, right? It, and my board, that's how all our conversations start. If it's a board voting uh, measure, it always starts with, is this good for the member? And that's how all credit union board meetings should start. Is it good for your member? And by doing that, you're putting the members first and you're returning value to the credit unions. And then of course, credit unions create great brands, right? This credit union has a phenomenal brand on this island, right, to, to be specific. But most credit unions worldwide create great brands and they create trust. Now, what credit unions seem to struggle with is digital engagement, right? I've seen some examples of credit unions using social media, uh, namely Facebook, to engage with their members. But overall, the digital engagement piece isn't there. Do you have an app in the app store? Is your app easy to use? Is it ubiquitous? Does it work on all different devices? Digital engagement seems to be thing, a thing that credit unions struggle with in general. Uh, telling your story. A lot of credit unions tell great stories when they're in this room, right? Telling a great story about how your credit union helped a member save their house or get a car or apply for a credit card to get a credit card or move money internationally. That doesn't help us. We need the story facing outward, right? Everybody in this room is an advocate or at least a fan of credit unions, right? We need that story facing outward so more people hear it. And when you tell that story, that story has to be told digitally, right? That's where the younger generation is going, is everything is digital first. Another thing credit unions struggle with is digital trust, right? Digital trust. How do you build trust through a browser? And, and then now, how do you build trust through an app? Right? How do you do that? Right? What did, what did, uh, what's a good example? What did Amazon do? Right? Amazon first came out, and they wanted to sell books online. Did they figure out how to sell books online? Sure, but that was the easy part. What the hard part was getting us to trust them. Right? When you buy things online, who's bought something online? Raise your hand if you bought something online. Right? Most of the room has bought something online. You can thank Amazon for that. Right? Amazon's the one who got us to trust them. Then, then we were able to buy books, and now we can buy, well, if you come to my house, an Amazon box shows up like every day, right? I don't know what my wife's buying, but boxes just keep showing up and showing up and showing up. And I don't question it, right? Because I'm in the Caribbean, right? And I've been lying on a beach all day, and I played some golf earlier. That's all she's going to see. All right, and then the other thing credit unions struggle, struggle with is uh, data and analytics, right? Harnessing the power of the data. Credit unions have an immense amount of data. Financial institutions in general have an immense amount of data about their membership, right? Like my credit union knows that I go to REI, a, a recreational equipment company, once a week. They know that I fill up my gas every Tuesday. They know that I eat at McDonald's. They know that I went to KFC. Whatever. All that transaction history the credit union has, but doesn't do anything with it, right? The first, in the United States, the very first documented use of financial institutions using the data they have was when a company called Target was breached. The Target breach, Target was breached to the tune of 300 million consumers. So what the financial institutions all figured out, like simultaneously, was that, hey, let's go through our history, find everybody who shopped at a Target in the last month, and reissue them cards, debit cards, credit cards, things like that, account, account login information. That was the first use out of necessity. So analytics is a problem that, that most financial institutions and specifically credit unions struggle with. So in doing my analysis, we're putting together the presentation in the book. These are some industry facts. Now they may not all be specific to your credit union, but the industry, the financial services industry in general, this is how it plays out. 40% of new members close their account in the first 100 days. And I, I called garbage on this, right? When I saw it, I'm like, there's no way this is true. But then I started thinking about it. For 11 years, I've been going to my credit union. We've had 7,500 members. For 11 years, I've been going to a board meeting, listening to my chief operations officer tell me how we added 60, 70, 80, 100 new members this month. Yet 11 years later, we still have 7,500 members, right? Now, I'm no mathematician, and I've got plenty of people who will back me up on that, right? But that doesn't make any sense to me. And I think the, the hidden piece here is member attrition, right? Members leaving the credit union or members opening accounts and not using them. That's a piece that we all struggle with, right? Because I know my credit union has hundreds of them. People who came in, got an auto loan, opened a regular savings account, 
paid off the auto loan, now the account just sits there. And that costs us money to service that. So there has to be a way to start using data to analyze that information and act upon it, right? Convince those members to be fully participating members. Remember, this is a cooperative movement, right? It's only as good as its weakest link. So if you have members who are a drag on the membership, you have to do something to incent them to be more fully participating in the financial institution. And then, of course, membership's aging, right? Everybody's getting older. I'm included in that, right? I can hardly read this screen in front of me, right? So the membership continues to age. In the, in the United States, the, in the biggest uh, crisis since the Great Depression, right, the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, we had financial experts going on CNN talking about how great a deal credit unions were, yet in the United States, credit unions only grew 1%. Really? That was really the best we could do? So that, that part bothered me because I'm not rooting for another great recession. So we need another opportunity to grow market share. And then sadly in the United States, and I don't know, I don't know what the stat is worldwide, but in the United States, credit unions are mostly irrelevant. There's roughly 6,000 credit unions and that represents 8% market share of the people in the United States. So it's a problem we're looking to address, but how do you change it? Right? What, what is the problem? Why aren't more people joining credit units? Is it service? I don't think so. Every survey I've read and conducted tells me that credit unions, the average satisfaction rating in credit unions is much higher than that in banks. I think on this island, if you were to survey people, your satisfaction rating would be much higher than, was that the Royal Bank of Canada up the street? And some of there's two banks right up the street, right? Do the survey, find out. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think it's trust, right? Credit union members trust their credit union. The general population trusts credit unions more than they trust banks, right? This, this bullet point is getting interesting though because I haven't updated the slide yet, but now what they're asking, it's Gartner and Forrester and the big research firms, Deloitte and Touche, they're asking about PayPal, they're asking about Venmo, they're asking about Amazon, they're asking about Facebook, Apple, Google, who do you trust and those tech companies are catching up to financial institutions in general. But for the most part, I don't think trust is the reason why we're not growing fast enough. And I don't think it's convenience, right? In Antigua, the Community First Credit Union had seven ATMs scattered all around the island. It's pretty convenient, right? In the US, we use a shared branch network where any credit union member can go to any other credit union ATM and use it. And that gives us roughly 30,000 ATMs right, nationwide, whereas the largest financial institution in the U.S., Chase, only has 18,000. So I don't think it's about convenience, and I know it's not about rates, right? What are credit unions known for? Better rates, lower fees, end of story, right? If you were to summarize, I think that's what we would all agree on, better rates and, and lower or no fees. So I don't think it's about rates. So if we're not growing because of these things, why is it we're not growing fast enough? I don't think it's about any of those things. I think it's about these kids, right? These two live in my house. Apparently they're mine, right? <laughs> they're mine, they're just a little goofy, right? But this generation, I'll give you a good anecdote, uh, an anecdotal story about these two. They come to work with me. I work on Saturdays, right? I travel Monday through Friday, so pretty much every Saturday I'm in the office. So I bring them with me, right? The office has Wi-Fi, we've got Starburst, all you can eat Starburst, and Hershey bars, and Wi-Fi. They're eight and 11, that's like heaven for them, right? So they come to work with me on Saturdays. Well, we have these phone booths in my office, the big boxes, you can go into it, they're soundproof. It's like getting in an airplane. The door makes that sound when the airline door closes and they're soundproof. So the kids go in there and they brought a couple friends. So there's like four of them in this little phone booth and there's a phone in there, an old school phone, a physically connected phone with a cord attached to it. They picked it up, they picked it up to make a call and it, they pushed a button and it made a dial tone. What did they do? They all ran out. What's that noise? What's that noise, Dad? <laughs> yeah, so I went in and I explained to them how a phone worked, right? Because they're used to call mom, call dad, right? My 11-year-old has a watch. She says, call dad, and she's talking to me on the watch, right? That's what they're used to. Trying to explain to these kids how they had to dial nine to get out and then dial the area code and then dial, no, I'm, I lost them. <laughs> so 
this is what you're dealing with, right? You're dealing with this generation of people. Now, obviously, an eight-year-old and 11-year-old aren't walking into your credit union, but I can tell you because I've hired some of them, 19s and 20-year-olds are no better, right? We've hired some of them to help us with some of the work at CU 2.0, and the stuff they don't know is amazing. Fax me something. What? What? What do you mean? They walk, what is that? It's a fax machine. What is that? It's a printer. It's all foreign to them, right? So that's what we're dealing with, right? And this is my favorite slide, right? So on the left is Cookie Monster, right? And on the right is a new car. Now, Chris, what in the world are you talking about here? I'm talking about this previous slide, these two, learn everything from Google. They learn everything from Google, right? They do that. We have a Google Home in the house. Anybody have one of those Google Home little bots? Say, hey, Google, what's the weather like today? And she goes, oh, it's 75 and sunny, right? Hey, Google, tell me a joke. And she tells you a stupid joke, right? Hey, hey, hey Google, what's nine times eight? Hey, Google, what's the square root of 144? That's how they learn stuff. So in this example here, imagine you're a cookie monster, right? And you want a cookie. Now, Cookie Monster is going to be pretty specific about the cookie he wants. Hey, Google, find me a chocolate chip cookie. And Google, oh, down 0.2 miles away is Bob's Cookie Shop, and those are the best cookies in town. That's the kind of granularity that Google's getting to, right? And they know where I am. They know what I asked for. I was specific about what I asked for. That's, so now, how does that translate to the car? Well, how do you make this leap, Chris? Your members aren't in the market for an auto loan. They're in the market for a new car. Hey Google, what are the best cars for people with kids? What are the best cars with all, what are the least expensive all wheel drive cars? What are the blah, 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 right? And you go on and on and on. That's how Google's searching. If you're not showing up in those searches, you're being left behind. Plain and simple. That's the way the new generation's looking for things and all things Google they trust. I guarantee you my kids trust Google more than they trust me. It's not even close. It's not even close. I mean, I haven't even told them about, about well, never mind. There's certain things I haven't told them about yet. Um, all right, so, so what are the expectations? Right, it used to be when I first got into the credit union business that I kind of measured us against the banks of the world, right? The BNCs, the Wells Fargo's, people like that. That's not what the younger generation's doing. These companies behind me and hundreds more are setting the expectations, right? So if you take, what's a good example here? Netflix. Netflix is my favorite. I think Netflix follows me around or listens to my conversations, right? Netflix knows exactly what movie or show I want to watch. How do they do that? Data. They have the data. What have I watched historically? Where am I, right? Because it offers me different suggestions when I'm in Redondo Beach, California at home because it knows I'm with my kids than when I'm in Seattle, Washington, when it knows I'm by myself or it can make a fair assumption that I'm by myself, right? So those are two different kinds of recommendations. And that's what's setting the potential new members, gener new members expectations. I mean, Amazon, right? I bought a kid's bike. This one floored me. I bought my 11 year old a bike when she was nine, right? She got a brand new bike because the older kid always gets the new stuff and the younger kid always gets the hand-me-downs. Really, am I the only one who does that to my kids? <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> I got all my brother's garbage. I mean, my daughter's gonna get all her older sister's garbage. So I bought the bike when she was nine. Just the other day, what, did I, what happened when I logged on to Amazon? I opened the app, time for a new bike, right? <laughs> they know my nine-year-old is three inches taller or however the average growth of a kid that age, and it's time for a new bike. Yep, $200 out the window, bye-bye. <laughs> So it's things like that, it, you know, the, the Uber, I know Uber's not here on Montserrat yet, but Uber is putting credit unions out of business. And you may think Uber, it's a taxi cab service, right? You open the app, you say I want a car, it knows where I am, it sends a car, right? So the Uber driver makes money, I make money, I get out of the car, I don't pay them, it's really seamless, right? So how is that affecting credit unions? I'll tell you how. In the United States, if you're a taxi cab driver, you have to buy a license. It's called a medallion. And we like to tax things. It's not just California, it's the entire nation. So you, ha you have to buy a, a medallion. And the price of that medallion in New York City was $350,000, right? That's a mortgage. 
right? It was $350,000. And credit unions were financing the cost of those medallions for people who wanted to start driving a taxi cab. So they would finance it, put it on, a, I think, a 30-year mortgage. It almost worked just like a mortgage. And then Uber comes along, completely disrupts the industry, and the price of a taxi cab medallion today in New York City is $75,000. So those credit unions who gave those loans to those people who wanted to become taxi cab drivers, those loans are all gone, right? You're writing those things off. You're never getting that money back. That's gone. And two credit unions have gone insolvent because of it. So technology definitely has the ability to disrupt, right? But then you can do, you can fight the good fight, right? Like Best Buy. Best Buy is an electronic store, <coughs> physical brick and mortar electronic store. Who was, who was just being crushed by Amazon. Just being crushed, you know, they thought they were gonna go the way of Toys R Us and go out of business and Blockbuster and all those horror stories. Best Buy fought back. They fought back, they, they went through a digital transformation. I can launch my Best Buy app, I can shop for what I'm looking for, I can have it shipped to my house or they'll have it ready for me at the store, the closest store, right? Three, three clicks, Th to the point where Amazon now partners with Best Buy. It was a great save, it's a, you, if you ever get a chance, Google it. I'm, Google it. You've all got devices. Again, go ahead, Google it. Right? They, they did a great job. Download the Best Buy app and see how it works. So these people, all these companies have, have these six things in common. Right? They've created great digital experiences. Right? Even my credit union app is a great digital experience. Right? I just press one button, log on to it. With the face recognition now, I point the phone at my face, I log on, check my balance, transfer some money, I'm done. Right? Creating a great digital experience is what you're after. Not just taking your website and mobile enabling it and letting people try to use a website on a phone. It's a different thing. You've got to have an app for that. Right? They provide recommendations. They know what I need next. The bike story, right? The 9-year-old to 11-year-old bike story. Well, what if you knew, you know, right, as a credit union, you know when your member has life-changing events, right? When they get married. Right? When they have kids, when they blah, 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 blah. Right? Those are triggers. Those are triggers that should, be that should raise flags manually or automatically. I don't really care which one, but it should be raising a flag that, hey, this member is going to be in the market for a mortgage. This member is going to be in the market for a new car, a bigger car, things like that. They're accessible across devices. Right? So it works on, I mean, today in the, in the van while we were touring around the beautiful island, all of us had different phones. Right? That sounds trivial, but it's a big thing to make sure the apps you build are accessible on any device and work equally as well on any device. Then, of course, they have integrated technology. They're customized to the hilt, and everything's real time. Right? Nothing's, nothing's delayed now. Nothing's batch. Nothing's analog. Everything's real time. So what is a credit union supposed to do? Right? Did I scare everybody enough about everything that's out there? Right? So, so what do you do about it? So we put together this, this acronym here, DREAM to differentiate through data, repeat and reinforce, excite and educate, automate and motivate. And the reason I put this up here and go through it is because if I'm boring you, you know that when I get to the M, I'm done, right? So you can track it. All right, so what do you do if you're a credit union? Well, first of all, you look at all these triggers right here, right? The desire, the fit, the depth, the triggers, the product, the if this, then that. If this member does this, then they're gonna need that, right? So the digital analytics piece is where you're using your data to figure out what members need. The fit is where you're figuring out, does this product fit my member, right? I already have a mortgage and two auto loans with my credit union. I'm probably not a prime suspect, so they're, gonna, they're not going to market those products to me, right? What's the wallet share, right? What's the depth of your relationship with each of your members? Do you have members that have accounts with you but also have accounts with the local bank up the street? And do they use that to transact their business, right? Because you're going to see with debit cards coming here, and for those of you who have debit cards and credit cards, transaction interchange income from the use of those cards is going to become a significant revenue source for you. And if it follows form like it normally does, if credit cards first, then debit cards, and debit card usage will surpass credit card usage, right? So in the United States, the primary form of payment for all consumers is debit cards. Not cash, not credit cards, debit cards. Right? Uh, the transaction triggers, right? What's a, tri what's a transaction that triggers an action from the credit union? And I'd like to use myself as an example here. I spent 18 years working at a Fortune 500 company called Pfizer. That meant every two weeks I got a paycheck for 18 years. 
it came into that account. What happened? I, I left to, to go do a startup, which I don't recommend. At 42 years old with two little kids, don't leave your steady job to go to a startup. Drives your wife nuts. So, but the paycheck stopped coming in. What did my credit union do? Nothing. They didn't even acknowledge it. They didn't even know it happened. They were so, I went to the next board meeting, told them I quit, and they, that's how they found out. Right? They would have never known because we weren't using the data that we have. That's a major thing. That should have been a huge red flag for my credit union because if you think about it, I had a mortgage and I had two auto loans at the time, right? And all of a sudden my paycheck stopped coming in. It should have been a problematic, right? All right, so differentiating. There's other ways to differentiate as well. So here's an example. Now I'm gonna get into some examples that we're doing at, at South Bay Credit Union. I have to show you the shirt because it took me like two years to get this. Right? I asked the CEO for like two years, give me a long sleeve shirt that's got the logo on it. So here's one of the things we're doing to differentiate, right? To set ourselves apart from the other financial institutions. We found out, and it really wasn't hard, all our members had smartphones, right? They all had devices and they all had our app on it. So we simply put the thing in our app where we, the member, me, so if you look at this screen here, that's actually me in the, in the right hand side there talking to Caesar. He's our virtual branch representative. I'm in, I think in that one, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, and Caesar was in Redondo Beach, California. And I pressed one button on my phone, I can't do it now because the Dodger game's on, the Los Angeles Dodgers are playing, and Caesar's not gonna answer. So, <laughs> baseball's kind of a big thing for him. So, I can press a button, and now I'm chatting with Caesar. Now the phone's validated my identity. I'm already authenticated. So my picture pops up, Caesar says, hey Chris, right, my name shows right on the screen, what can I do for you today? And I say, hey, Caesar, I think I need to transfer some money from, or whatever I tell Caesar I need to do. Normally, I just say, hi, Caesar, I'm showing you off in front of a group of people, right? And he laughs and then hangs up on me. But this is the type of service that is completely differentiating us from all other financial institutions in the area. Uh, here's, a, here's a great one. This is, now I'm gonna get into some more credit union examples. This credit union is called Nimeo. I think it's a made up word but that's what they wanted to call themselves. Nimeo took a look at their top 10 competitors, right? Who are my members banking with outside of my credit union, right? And I don't know if you can see it all from back there, but PayPal was the number one. PayPal was number one there, right? Followed by the banks, the, the, you know, the top five, Capital One, JP Morgan, Citibank, right? And then on the FinTech side, who are my members using from a FinTech standpoint? And PayPal again was at the top, right? With Venmo, Intuit, Square, and then some companies that you wouldn't think are FinTechs, but they are. Target and Walmart. Target, Walmart, Costco, the big re any big retailer is a FinTech threat because they're gonna try to take the transactions and own those transactions and convert them to ACH transactions as opposed to card-based transactions. Card-based transactions, my credit union makes money. ACH-based transactions, my credit union doesn't make any money. It's an actual thing. So using wallet share, depth, and transactions and triggers, right? Transactions equal triggers. They, then Nimeo was able to respond to this and no. So they created a marketing campaign. And I know you can't read this on the screen, and part of that's on purpose. <laughs> we, Nimeo created a marketing campaign. They posted stuff on their website that tried to get people to load the credit union's card into their PayPal account. And they created a marketing campaign around six or seven different things that you all see here. And then they tracked the results for it. They didn't just put it on the internet and hope people clicked on it. They tracked the results. And if you probably can't read it, but at the bottom of the screen, there's actual members' email addresses and how many times they clicked on links. Now that's, that's a sales funnel right there, right? That's how you know who's ready to buy. Those six people down there who clicked, one person clicked on it 21 times, right? If they click on your ad 21 times, my guess is you should be calling them and selling them something or emailing them and selling them something or sending them a message in the app or whoever you sell. I don't really care how you sell, just sell, right? That's help the members because they're clearly looking for that product. Here's a good one, NIH. I, don't, I just like to pick on Wells Fargo um, because they have such a poor reputation in the States. Right? The money flooded into NIH, which is National Institute of Health Federal Credit Union in Washington, D.C., flooded in in February of 2017, right? when Wells Fargo was having all those problems. Now, what does that mean? What, what, what value is this? Yeah, I know that all this money came into my credit union, 
from Wells Fargo at this date, what does that mean? Well, it means that you should be looking at the economic factors that drove the money there. What was it? And in, th in this case, it was social factors, right? It was the Wells Fargo reputation risk. They were, they were lying about accounts, right? Wells Fargo was opening accounts for people that people didn't authorize to be opened. So they were inflating their account and they got called on it. And that's why everybody left them in February of 17. But knowing this allows my credit union to tailor a program to them. Oh, you deposited, you took your savings account from Wells Fargo and you moved it over here. Maybe you need a checking account. Maybe you need a debit card. Maybe you need an auto loan. What do you have with Wells Fargo that we can take that business for you? Because we're better for you. We're a credit union. Right? Uh, here's, they went nuts with the study. They, they, once they figured out Wells Fargo, was, they were getting money from Wells Fargo, they analyzed every piece of data they possibly could and found out where all their money comes from. This is a study all credit unions can do today. You can do it today. You know where the deposits come from. It's in the file that you post. All right, so next up is, is repeating and reinforcing, right? And re repeating, by repeating it, you create a unique and personalized member experience, right? So my credit union doesn't do one-to-many marketing. It does one-to-one, -one, right? So now there may be 4,000 members that get the same ad because they're all eligible for the same product or they all have the same need. And then reinforcing that through social media, right? And I think there were some good examples. I'll get to some good examples of reinforcing through Facebook and Yelp seem to be the two most commonly used social media platforms. And if you don't claim your presence on Facebook and you don't claim your presence in Yelp, you're opening yourself up for other people to claim your presence. Matter of fact, if I was you, I'd claim the Royal Bank of Canada's presence on Facebook and Yelp, right? I would claim that and, and sit on it, right? So they don't do this. Because social media, remember the picture of the two little girls? Social media is where they go to get validated. Am I making the right decision? We all do it. We've all done it for years. I used to do it with my brother. Hey, I'm thinking about buying this car. Is that a good idea? Well, I don't do it anymore, right? I don't, I don't ask my mom, is this a good investment account for me? She doesn't know. I use social media to do it, right? And there's a million different places you can go for it, a million different social media platforms. You need to figure out which ones work best. I think here, Facebook, is everybody on Facebook? Yeah, Facebook seems to be the most popular. I knew it was going to take off when my mom got on it. <laughs> All right, so, so now I'm going to tell you a little story about how people use social media, right? I'm going to emphasize the point I just made. So you saw the picture of the girls, Danny and Caitlin, 8 and 11. They like to eat at Subway, right? They love Subway sandwiches. So I'm driving around. My wife, I'm driving. My wife's in the passenger seat. Kids in the back. Hey, can we go to Subway? I'm like, okay, great. There's got to be one. There's 27,000 of them worldwide. I'm pretty sure we're going to run into one, right? Not to my wife. Nope. Every subway is different to her. So she yelped it. Let's find out which subway we're going to go to. So she yelped it. And I know you can't read this from back there, but basically it came down to the top one is nice and clean, good service, two miles from the Reno Tahoe border on the Reno side. Looks like they have more options for fountain drinks. The one on the bottom, the comment is probably the dirtiest and slowest subway I've ever been to. Waited 30 minutes for a sandwich, one person working at lunch rush. Which subway do you think I went to? Yeah. Exactly. But that's the way decisions are made these days, right? That's how consumers are making their decisions. So I thought I'd bring in a, a couple examples. Um, Community First in Antigua, I was there the other day. They're doing a great job with Facebook. Great job engaging their members with Facebook. These videos that you see up here, I'm not going to play them for you, but they actually have member testimonials. Member testimonials. That's a powerful thing. That is, matter of fact, that is the most powerful form of marketing and advertising is member testimonials. So they're doing a great job there. All right, now moving on. How do you excite and educate, right? So if 40% of new members close their account in the first 100 days, we're clearly not wowing them with our experience, right? Why would I close my account right after op I opened it? It's because the experience wasn't what I expected, right? I ate, they opened a new burger place near my house and everybody was raving about it. I went in there and ordered a burger and the experience wasn't what I was expecting and I've never gone back. Plain and simple, right? So if you're not wowing them, they're not coming back. So here's an example of a credit union using video, right? Video, and, and I think I skipped over this. If, if, I, if I'm repeating myself, please forgive me. But video content is going to consume, it, it, video content is going to be consumed 80% of the time by the year 2020. 
80% of content on the internet is going to be video. That's a massive number. So if, you're fine, if your credit union isn't into video right now, you need to figure out a way to do that, right? All the realtors are doing it, politicians are doing it, that video is the way to consume content. So Amy here, and this video works about half the time, so we'll see what we got going here. So it takes Amy about, what, 40 seconds to record that? She does that for all the new members that come in. It's a personalized message. Hey, Steve, thanks for joining the credit union. Hey, Jane, thanks for joining the credit union. She goes through it once a week, knocks them all out, and they're growing so much now that now she's pushed that out to the branch managers, and they're doing it, right, because they're open hundreds of accounts. So she can't physically do it, but you get the point, right? That's a differentiator right there. That will resonate with the member. In case you're wondering what I did, I took a picture of her on my screen with you all in the background because I do that every time I use her video so she knows how widespread, she, how popular she's getting, right? So far she's been in 14 states and now the Caribbean. <laughs> so Amy's getting very popular. All right, so I'm, I'm not sure how germane this is to this group, but has anybody heard of the $32 ramen, right? When somebody uses their debit card to go buy ramen and it turns out they don't have the funds, that they, it gets approved but it overdrafts their account and they get hit with overdraft fees and next thing you know they pay $32 for a bowl of ramen. Right, it happens. It happens more often than you would think. And when it happens in credit unions, credit unions generally reverse the fee if they even charge it, right? So the member has to call in and say, hey, I was charged this fee and, and you can take this to any fee that you charge ever. The member calls in, they know which rep to call which member service rep to call, the member service rep that's soft and is gonna reverse the fees, they'll call that rep and get the fee reversed. Well, if you know you're gonna reverse the fee, don't charge it in the first place, or better yet, charge it and reverse it automatically, send them an email saying, hey, we saw you got hit with this fee, we're sorry about that, here's a video to encourage you, to show you how not to get hit with this fee. Right, that's a good way to do it. So. That's exciting to members. Now we'll move on to educating, right? Like I said before, in, in all things Google, we trust. And society has moved from a buyer beware, right? A lot of you in this room look like you could be my age. And you used to go buy a car and you were worried you were gonna buy a car that didn't work, right? Complete definition of buyer beware. Well, that's gone. You go to buy a car now, you can type in the VIN number and see if it's been an accident. We've moved from a buyer beware to a seller beware. Buyers show up show up ready, right? They show up informed, they show up educated. They don't show up halfway, right? I did more research before I bought this $50 watch, right, than I did before I bought my first car. So that's, that's just the way things are going. And it's because consumers these days don't wanna waste their time and they wanna be knowledgeable. So here's another good example of, of oh, community first again, using Facebook to educate members whether that's on auto loans, whether that's on home loans, whatever it's about, if you are educating your member, right? If you're exciting them and you're educating, you're gonna get the sales, right? That's as simple as it goes. And in Google's eyes, when the credit union members or your potential members are searching for auto loans or mortgage loans or savings accounts, and you have the content out there that educates people about it, and you keep showing up in the Google searches, Guess what? You become an expert and you go up to the top of the list. Has anybody ever Google anything and wonder why those things, certain things are at the top of the list? It's not by accident. You can buy your way up there, but with Google ads, right? You can do that, but nobody clicks on those, right? You have to organically get yourself up to the top of that list. And there's a science behind it. There's a science behind it. And the science is, not to get too technical with you, but the science is um, location first and then video and then images, and then text. That's how you get to the top, in that order. So in the education, right, this is old school education when we were selling to members. We would yell at them, this is what you want, this is how you do this, this is, that's not it, right? 
Educate in a one-to-many approach through your content. Create the content, put it on your website. Members can self-educate, prospective members can self-educate. And there's a million ways to do it. Videos, blogs, facts, whatever you need. All right, the digital engagement process, I don't like this slide because it's too wordy, but basically by putting the content out there for the potential members, you're putting them in the top of the funnel there. And as they read more stuff, they weed themselves through to the bottom of the funnel. So the best example of this is, is I can't meet a woman and marry her the same day. Right? I mean, I could if I was in Vegas, but I'm not. So <laughs> you can't meet someone and marry them in the same day. There's a process you have to go through, right? You have to meet, you have to socialize her, right? Do my friends approve of her? Does my family approve of her? You have to get to know each other. There's several steps. It's that way when you're selling your services to potential members in the community, right? They have to know you exist. They have to know that you have the product. They have to know that they're eligible to join. And then they'll start looking to, to buy products and services. So stepping them through a digital engagement process is good. Um, here's another great example, Tropical Financial uh, down in Tampa, Florida. They have the middle one there is Valentine's Day. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of romance, I very rarely think of my credit union. Right? It's just, just not something I do. But on Valentine's Day, if I'm desperate enough, I'll click that link. So in this case, they had 163 clicks on this. Right? They're quickly becoming experts, and they're showing up at the top of the Google searches. All right, and then, now let's talk about automation. And this is one of my favorite ones because this is what I used to think automation was, right? Making life easier on the employees of the credit union, right? Instead of Sally there processing one check at a time, we bought this big machine and now we can process 10,000 checks at a time, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about automating for the member. That's where this should start with. Is this automating, is this making my member's life easier? Not the employee's life the member's life, right? Are you automating for the member? And when you do that, you have to think holistically about automation and how it works, right? There's automation on the member side, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen there, right? Online, mobile banking, ATMs, digital wallets, and then there's automation in the branch, in the physical side of things, right? Through your lending, your contact center, your branch. All of that has to be automated for the member, for the member, not for the credit union. Here's an example of something we did at South Bay Credit Union for automation. See those little cards? Right, they're little squares. Here's, here's one of them here, here's my card. It's a tiny little square, right? It's meant to be disposable, right? On the back of it is one of those QR codes. Any one of your phones can scan this QR code and boom, you have my contact information in your phone. So we simply took it a step further here and you can scan that and boom, it starts a loan application for you. Boom, it starts a new membership for you. Whatever we were selling them, that's how, that's how we've automated. And the, it's funny, the environment this office is in is in, um, it's like a shared workspace place, kind of like a WeWork where all these millennials, all these 20 something year old guys with man buns, you guys seen those? Those are ridiculous. So, <laughs> sorry, nobody in here has a man bun, do they? Okay, good. So, <laughs> this environment is full of all these millennials and they gravitate towards this. We're opening 100 memberships a month at this one location, and we simply put these out in the common area. That's all it is. All right. And then I, I, talk, I know we've talked a lot about digital transformation, but what goes hand in hand with that is the physical transformation. Right? So at South Bay Credit Union, we had a branch. We had a, a large building. It, wasn't, it might have been about this size, right? But our large building was built in the 1950s and updated in the 1960s. So it was a little bit behind the times. And we were faced with a choice, right? Do we completely remodel this or, or, or do we move on to a newer location? And what do we do when we move on? Do we buy one building or do we buy three smaller buildings? That's what we did. We sold the main building. We took a hair salon, a gas station from the 1920s, and a donut store. And we, those three across the top there, we retrofitted them revamped them, refurbished them, whatever you want to call it, and turned them into branches. Now we have a larger footprint. We have a physical footprint, right? That's much larger than it was. And if you look, the pictures at the bottom show the furniture. I guess it doesn't show it so well. But we put in, right, uh, let's see, bottom left is a, uh, an intelligent ATM, right, that during business hours, I can video chat with a, a member service rep. So my member service reps don't have to be at one branch. 
Matter of fact, they're not. They're all in one central location, and you can video chat right there. And it'll do all the stuff in ATM. will do withdrawals, loan payments, transfers, things like that. And then on the right-hand side of the picture there, you can't really tell it here. All the furniture's on wheels. It's all mobile, so we can reorganize the branch based on the traffic we're expecting. And then what you also don't see there is all of our reps have iPads. We use iPads at my credit union, and they're all experts in the internet, in the online banking, and in the mobile app. Like, they are experts. And their goal is to, when a member walks into the branch, to make it so that member never has to walk in that branch again. Right? Why should I have to go visit my credit union to transfer money? Let's save them time. Let's save them money. Let's, but you'll never get the membership there if the staff isn't there. It's one of the key takeaways from this. You will never get the membership to behave the way you want them to if the staff doesn't get there first. And then, oh, this is a picture of that. I was telling you the community workspace we put a branch in. This goes along the, the genre of don't be afraid to fail. Right? And that sounds weird, but if you're going to fail, fail forward fast. Right? So many times credit union CEOs never want to take a chance because they don't want to go back to the board and say, oh, we tried this new loan product and it didn't work and we had to discontinue it. From my point of view, that's a great thing. Hey, good job. Way to try something new. So this is an example of that. We opened a branch. It's a pop-up branch. It cost us $1,800 to open this branch. We have three employees there. Caesar sits in there. Caesar, the video guy, he sits in there. So we simply moved in, brought our laptops in. The furniture was already there. We were up and running in half a day, right? And the test is, will we be able to get those 20 and 30-something millennial members joining our credit union if we open a location where they work, right? They all work in this building. There's 350 offices, probably 500 employees in this office from all different sectors of aerospace and and blockchain and fintech and lawyers and entertainment and video all work in there. The point is they're our target market. That's our target market, the 20 to 30, 30 year olds. And how do we know that? Well, we've done a, I mean, let me focus on what we've done and what a, a good recommendation for credit unions is. Do your study of your membership and find out who your most profitable, who your best members are. Most, whatever, however you define that, whoever your best members are, who would you like to have more of? figure out what they have in common and create a persona. So in my credit union, we call them Sally and Tim. Sally and Tim are 34 years old, they've got two little kids, they've got a mortgage and they've got an auto loan. That's our A member. We want more Sally's and more Tim's. Steve is the member we don't want anymore. Steve has a $5 share account he hasn't used in years and it's costing us money to create statements for him and, and just the general upkeep on his account. We don't want Steve, we want Sally and Tim. If you, do, if you start with that analysis, you'll have much more success. All right, and then finally, motivate. Right? Once you find these members and once you get them in the door, motivate them by acting like a credit union, not a bank. So the best example I, could, I can give you is, is this company, REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated. It's a cooperative in the States. And they do dividends. I get a dividend check every year based on how much I spend. Right? So if I get a $500 dividend check, I spent too much right? <laughs> at REI during the course of the year buying. You know, and they sell sleeping bags and camping gear and fishing poles and guns and things like that. So they offer a patronage dividend. So what would the credit union version be of that? A patronage dividend. That's a pretty easy jump. right? Only 5% of credit unions offer a patronage dividend back to their members. So that's one way. The other, way, the other thing I like REI does, they have training and tips. So you can go into an REI and they will teach you how to do whatever it is you want to do. I'm going to learn how to fly fish. Okay, great. We'll teach you how to fly fish. I'm going to go hike Mount Whitney. Okay, well, you need these shoes and you need a pair of poles and you need crampons, whatever you need, right? So what's the credit union version of that? Holding workshops. This space is a perfect example. You could hold a great workshop here, talking about financial literacy, talking about retirement planning, talking about investments, buying your first house, whatever it may be. Um, return policies, REI is great, right? I hike Mount Whitney. It's 14,000 feet. It's in California. I bought a pair of poles, right? Because I'd never hiked. And um, it's a dumb idea for me to do this. Anyways, so I hiked Mount Whitney, and I just couldn't get over the fact that I was walking with poles. Like, I'm, like, like, I'm, like I need the help to walk, right? Why do I need these poles? So I never used them. I threw them in my backpack, never used them. They were a little scratched up. I went back to REI, returned them, got my money back. No questions asked. 
How does that translate? What's the credit union version of that? The credit union version of that is maybe a rate reset, or maybe a skip a pay, or maybe uh, maybe a reevaluation of your fees. There's things that credit unions can do. Uh, REI also has a garage sale. They sell all this, those poles I returned. I bought them for 50 bucks. I returned them. They probably sold them to somebody else for 25 bucks. Right? They were used. REI had no use for them anyways. Might as well get the best you can out of it. Uh, the credit union version of that would be financial tune-ups. Right? Reevaluate your, with your members their financial situation. Right? Member car sales are big in the states where credit unions will sell their repossessed cars. Right? And the last one is make the member feel like they own the place. Right? The members in the room, you own the credit union. Right? You should feel like you own the credit union. You have a vote in the credit union. You have a share in the credit union. 